Ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes at Joburg Zoo? Dreamstream has collaborated with Joburg Zoo Friends to create We Filmed a Zoo. This weekly show documents what's happening at the Johannesburg Zoo. The show was created to help raise funds for the important projects the zoo regularly undertakes. The family-friendly content is a perfect way to keep the kids occupied while helping to contribute to the well-being of the animals. The Dreamstream app is available on Android. iPhone users can access it via their mobile-friendly site. You can sign up for a free one-month trial without entering any card details up front. A short how-to video is available on their YouTube channel, dream.stream.za, or engage with them via their website, dreamstream.co.za. To see promos of We Filmed a Zoo, visit and follow Dreamstream social media platforms on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube. Welcome back to episode 149, The Serial Crimes of Rosemary Ndlovu. This is part two of this episode. If you haven't listened to part one yet, go back and do that now, and then come back here. This episode is sponsored by the upcoming release movie, Asphalt City. First responders are vital components of well-handled crime scenes, and paramedics are almost always one of the first to encounter some really traumatic and dangerous situations. This month, Asphalt City, a brand new film, hits our screens in South Africa, which will take you deep into the underbelly of this honourable and often difficult profession. Ollie Cross is a young paramedic assigned to the New York City night shift with an uncompromising and seasoned partner, Jean Rutkowski. Each 911 call is often dangerous and uncertain, putting their lives on the line every day to help others. Cross, played by Ty Sheridan, is guided through the dark night shifts in a city clearly in crisis by Rutkowski, played by Sean Penn. Soon, their experiences start to test their relationship and the thin line of ethics they walk between life and death. And, True Crime South Africa listeners, I've got two sets of double tickets to give away to go watch Asphalt City. And not just that, no movie is complete without popcorn and blue slushy, right? So included in the prize is a refreshment voucher for two as well. You just can't miss this. So make sure you enter the giveaway on True Crime South Africa's social platforms right after you've listened to this episode. Asphalt City premieres in South African cinemas on the 29th of March. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. In part one of episode 149, we met Rosemary Nomia Ndlovu and traversed her upbringing, first marriage, and the suspicious deaths of her son and husband. As we left Rosemary, she was an SAPS member working her way up the ranks and had just started a new relationship with Maurice Mabasa. In part one, we saw Rosemary as a young child being taken by her aunt Lucy to live with her for a while, as she didn't feel the girl was being cared for well enough. At the time, Lucy's own young son was also living in the household. Witness Madala Khomu and Rosemary had grown up together and were cousins. Witness was a man who kept to himself. He was deeply religious, had never married, and didn't have any children. He spent most of his leisure time involved in church activities 
or with a small group of carefully selected friends. He lived in Johannesburg and picked up peace jobs as often as he could. Whenever he had money, he always sent some home to his mother. Given how measured and careful Witness was about how he spent his time, it seems in shocking contrast to the end he would meet. In January 2012, Lucy received a phone call from Rosemary. She says the conversation soon turned to birthdays, and Rosemary asked her when she and Witness were born. She wasn't satisfied only with the day and month, Lucy said. Rosemary wanted to know what years they were born in too. Perhaps to soften the strange questioning, Rosemary quickly offered to send Lucy 200 rand for a birthday cake after realising that Lucy had recently celebrated her birthday. Lucy gratefully accepted. And then the conversation shifted again. Rosemary asked whether Witness had a funeral policy. She claimed she'd heard he was hanging around with a bad crowd in Johannesburg and she was concerned something might happen to him. After that conversation, Lucy had decided to register her son on her burial policy just in case, but she'd also had a discussion with Witness demanding to know whether he really was up to no good. Surely, she'd said at the time, Rosemary as a police officer would know best. Over the next few months, Rosemary called Lucy several times, checking up to see whether she'd followed her advice and placed Witness on her burial policy. Witness's younger sister, Eva, lived not far from him. She tried not to bother her brother too much, but they regularly met up and chatted on the phone. She last spoke to her brother on the phone on Friday the 30th of March 2012. They'd arranged to meet up at the Boulders shopping centre in Midrand on the Saturday. Witness was going to buy his younger sister some clothes so she could go job hunting. That Saturday, though, Witness never arrived for their arranged meet-up. And he wasn't answering his phone, either. Later that day, Eva's cousin Godfrey phoned her, asking whether she'd seen or spoken to Witness. Eva explained that he hadn't arrived for their meeting. Godfrey told her that he'd been alerted to Witness being missing by Rosemary, who claimed that Witness's landlord had phoned her wanting to know why Witness's rent hadn't been paid. Eva immediately found this strange. She knew for a fact that her brother was never late in paying his rent, and she also wondered why on earth Witness's landlord would have Rosemary's number. Both Eva and Godfrey felt that it was safe to not panic, at least for a few days, and they hoped Witness would turn up. But Rosemary was not prepared to wait around. She phoned Godfrey the very next day, telling him that she was going to start a search for Witness and he should join her. Godfrey agreed, and Rosemary suggested that the best place to start would be Olifantsfontein Police Station. Of course, Godfrey assumed Rosemary would know best, being a police officer herself. At the police station, the pair were told that an unidentified body of a male matching Witness's description had indeed been discovered. Witness Kormu had been walking home from work when he was attacked. His skull had been crushed and his body was left in a piece of felt in Olifantsfontein. Shortly after this information came to light, Eva received a call from Rosemary. Bizarrely, Rosemary told the young woman that they'd found Witness and he was safe and well. Rosemary's behaviour over the next few hours only became more strange. She told Eva she'd be sending her money that she claimed Witness had given her. That money never arrived in her bank accounts, but Rosemary sent her 30 rand in airtime. The young woman had never received such gifts from her aunt before. Then, that evening, 
Eva began to receive telephone calls from witnesses' friends. They were conveying their condolences for witnesses' death. Eva eventually realised the horrible truth and called her mother. Lucy had already been informed by Rosemary. The next day, Rosemary picked Eva up and took her to a taxi so that she could go home and be with her mother. She says her aunt behaved so strangely, barely talking to her and giving her no condolences for her brother's passing, nor an explanation as to why she'd lied to the young woman initially. Rosemary was, however, very involved in ensuring all witnesses' documents, like his ID and death certificates, were secured. Witnesses' funeral was incredibly difficult, Eva says. Her mother had very little money, and although the funeral policy she'd taken out on Rosemary's insistence did pay out, it didn't cover very much. Rosemary contributed 200 rand and asked her sister Audrey for another 200 to purchase some chicken for the mourners to eat. Witness Homu was laid to rest near his mother's home, and although Rosemary and her mother Sophie attended the funeral, Eva and her mom say that both women left immediately after the funeral and neither ever returned to visit Lucy or follow up by phone to see how she was coping. Lucy's niece and sister, who'd both been rather present in her life before that, were suddenly no longer interested in maintaining contact. Although Eva and later Lucy too became deeply suspicious of Rosemary's strange behaviour during that time, they had no idea that just two days after Witness's death, Rosemary had come into a large amount of money. Old Mutual had paid her 31,000 rand, and another policy had paid out 100,000 rand. Both policies were related to the death of Witness Homu, who'd been listed as Rosemary's spouse on the policy forms. The policies had been taken out around the time Lucy said she'd had that odd conversation with Rosemary about birth dates. The fact that Witness was listed as her spouse meant that Rosemary's monthly cost for the policies was extremely low. Neither company had asked for proof that Witness was her spouse, nor did they check that the signature on the documents was actually Witness's. It was not. And the man had no idea that there were policies out on his life. Witness's murder brings forth two very important aspects of this case. The policies and the funerals. The funeral and life insurance policies were the mechanism Rosemary and Blovu used to make her murders profitable. This is not an uncommon occurrence in female serial killers. We saw it with Daisy Tamalka too, and several female killers in the US. This case brought to the forefront how often insurance fraud of this kind actually occurs. For the Rosemary's Hitless Companion podcast, I spoke with Edward Siewa, who appeared in the Showmax original, and because I think it's really important for us to understand the insurance side of this case, I'm going to include some of Edward's insights here too. My name is uh, Edward Siewa, and I am uh, an independent financial consultant specializing in the area of insurance uh, advice, uh, retirement planning, investment planning, as well as uh, trust and estates. My actual experience span since 2005. I am the managing director of a company called Net Wealth Analytics, which is an authorized financial service provider, authorized by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority under license 45110. One of my major considerations in the companion podcast 
and also in this coverage, is to ensure that we aren't giving other people a roadmap on how to commit insurance fraud. But I do also want to arm people with knowledge on how to protect themselves from something like this happening to them. So I asked Edward to explain the difference between funeral and life insurance policies, and here's what he had to say. I would like to take this opportunity to dwell in detail around the area of life insurance as well as funeral policies. What I would like to discuss in the main is to indeed take listeners on differentiation between the two and further broaden the understanding around this subject matter. What I will actually outline is the following. One is a life cover. What is the purpose of one having to take up a life cover? And equally, what is funeral policy? And what is the purpose for one to ensure that they take a funeral policy? The first explanation that I would like to give it is in relation to what is life insurance policy and also explain the purpose of a life policy. Oh, but before I get there, let me hasten to say that there are serious distinctions between funeral policies as well as life policies. For example, funeral policies in the main and in South Africa are the entry points to a life policy, meaning uh, funeral policies are regarded as entry into the life insurance space. Majority of the people do not start by taking life insurance. They start by taking a funeral policy, then thereafter, graduate into taking life policy. However, it does not mean that you can't actually get life insurance in an instant or as a first resort. What is the difference between life insurance as well as funeral policy? Life insurance, by definition, is an insurance that is taken to protect a particular circumstances. That circumstance can be to protect your spouse, to protect your children, to protect spouse and or children against the potential devastating financial losses. Let me explain what I mean by this. Here I am, it's me and my spouse, we've got children. I am the sole breadwinner in my household or my spouse is working as much as I am working. Then we've got joint household income if both of us are working. If that is the case, then the question becomes because now we've got a joint household income. Let's assume I'm bringing 20,000 rent to the household and my spouse is bringing 20,000 rent. It means jointly we live our lifestyle on 40,000 per month. So then the question then becomes, how will my spouse and my children survive if my 20,000 was not on the table on a month to month basis? Then that is where the potential risk or devastation comes in. Therefore, to ensure against that particular 20,000, I will then take up a life insurance policy uh, which will ensure my life to ensure that if I pass on, then a lump sum is paid to my spouse uh, so that it can mitigate against the risk of not having the 20,000 per month that I was bringing home. So that is the fundamental reason for one to take life insurance. So. Let's take, for example, someone who has got a um, house uh, which was acquired through a bond. 
and you find that the house is 400,000 and the bond that I was granted by the bank, it's 100%, meaning that they've granted me 100% of the bond loan, meaning it's 400,000 that now I owe the bank. That house then, it's an, categorized as an asset. The liability is the bond, which is 400,000 rand. Then I'm able then to balance the two because the asset is the house, the 400,000 rent bond is the liability. So I'm able to take up a life insurance policy so that in the event of death, the 400,000 pays towards the bonds and settle the bond 100% and it is, it is able to convert that property into a full 100% asset where then the bank, after the surviving members who I've nominated as beneficiaries to pay the bank or if I've nominated the bank as a beneficiary upon my death, then the bond will be paid. Then um, the house become an asset. Then my family will then get what they call title deeds. So that is the whole strategy around one needing to have a life insurance, meaning the strategic objective and the need is that if you want to protect your spouse or children, spouse and children, or any other immediate family member from potentially devastating financial losses. That could result in the event of death. So effectively, the whole objective is to pro provide financial security, to assist in paying off debts, and also to assist in making sure that the, the, my family is able to pay for living expenses and any other expenses that might emerge as a consequence of one passing on. So that is the, what life insurance is for. However, funeral policy, it is a policy that is taken to protect against financial demand as a consequence of death, either of myself as a life insured or those family members that are toward. I'll give you an example. Many members take up funeral policy because they are trying to mitigate the risk of not having enough financial resources at the time of burial. Therefore, if that is the case, you don't have adequate financial resources to actually pay in the event of death either of self or of immediate family member who is maybe spouse, children, or extended family members. Then you take up a funeral policy so that when there is death in the family, then you know that the funeral policy amount will pay and its objective will be to take care of the cost related to the funeral. In any policy situation, there are three roles involved, an insured person, a beneficiary, and a policyholder. If I take out a funeral policy on my partner, which will pay out to me in the event of my partner's death, I am both the policyholder and the beneficiary, and my partner is the insured. That situation is less common then my partner phoning in to take out their own funeral policy, in which case they would become both the policyholder and the insured, and I would be the beneficiary. What Rosemary did with Witness, and as we'll see later in the case with others too, was that she became the policyholder and the beneficiary. These types of scenarios are extremely dangerous as it has to be absolutely ascertained for sure that the insured person is aware of the coverage. If the insured person is the policyholder, that is far safer. But it can't always be the case, because sometimes only one partner works in a relationship and the debit orders, etc. are always in their name. There's no doubt that the insurance companies in this case were negligent to some extent but they didn't necessarily contravene any laws in allowing Rosemary to take out these policies. She committed the fraud, but they had a responsibility here too. And later on in this coverage, I'll talk about how the insurance industry 
needs to step up and protect insured persons better, even if those insured persons are not their paying clients. The other aspect of this case, as was shown so tragically in Witnesses' Murder, is the cultural aspect of the importance of funerals in the grieving process of black South Africans. Certainly, laying our loved ones to rest is important for everyone. And I think we came to deeply understand how important that process is to many of us during COVID when that was taken away from so many. But the tradition and culture behind the funeral process in traditional black African communities also has a deeply spiritual aspect, which is not necessarily understood by people outside of those communities. When I did the companion podcast, I had a co-host who I was incredibly grateful to work with because she brought amazing insights to this case. I first connected with Mfundo Ndala when I started the True Crime South Africa podcast back in 2019, and I was looking for other South African true crime content creators. We were few and far between back then, and although there are a few more of us now, the OGs always stay in touch. I feel Mfundo and I share the same ethical core around true crime. The way she creates content on YouTube about South African crimes is victim-focused, non-sensationalist, and just really well put together. If you've been following my journey and supporting me as a true crime content creator over the years, I'd love it if you would support and embrace Mfundo in the same way. You can find her on YouTube. Her channel is at Mfundo Ndala, and her Instagram handle is at It's Mfundo Ndala. Please follow her there and help her to grow the ethical true crime community in South Africa. Mfundo was able to provide some insights into the types of costs experienced in these events and the deep importance of funerals. Nguni funerals tend to be very expensive because there is a mourning period that happens prior to the funeral where members of the community and those that knew the deceased come to offer their condolences to the family. During this mourning period, you have to account for feeding visitors, preparing the home itself, whether that be extensive cleaning or even structural repairs to the home, travel to and from the mortuary, home affairs for the death certificate, and in some cases, travel to the offices of the insurer. Sometimes the body needs to be moved from one province to another as the deceased may pass away in the area where they work but maybe still have family living in a completely different town or province. Without community burial societies, it becomes difficult to cover the costs of these things and can often lead to costly delays. Another thing to consider is the time cost of these activities, especially when public transport is involved. This doesn't even take into account the cultural costs of funerals, the cleansing of the family and the purchase of animals that will be needed for cultural rites to be performed. Depending on where you are and the specific animal that you might need, it can cost anywhere from 2,000 to upwards of 12,000 rand per animal. After the funeral and depending on where the person has been buried, the family may even erect a tombstone, and that price can also vary from 3,000 to 20,000 rand. If it's not done on the same day as the funeral, there is another event that takes place for this called the unveiling. Again, there are catering costs, travel costs, and because this is no longer a somber occasion, there could even be entertainment costs for this particular event. I want to preface this by saying that I am not Tonga and don't have any direct relation to the Shitonga nation. So my information is a combination of research, speaking to people who are Shitonga, as well as my knowledge of Ndebele customs and traditions. Shitonga is closely related to Isizulu, Xhosa, Swati and Ndebele. And we all fall under the Nguni subgroup. And as such, we share a lot of cultural practices especially in cases of marriage, 
birth and death. All of these life events are very community centered and heavily involve contributions from family, both immediate and extended, as well as friends, neighbors, and the community at large. Contributions are not strictly money related, but there is obviously an expectation that those with disposable income and the means to do so make a greater financial commitment to the planning and execution of the funeral, especially those that have policies in the name of the deceased, as of course these policies are often intended to help offset funeral costs and they're not meant to be used as a means to enrich yourself. Life insurance itself is not something that is common in our cultures for a myriad of reasons, one of which being ulterior motives to getting life insurance against someone's life. It can be seen as a crass statement of putting monetary value on someone's life and in some circumstances, even trying to plan their death for your own self-enrichment. In contrast to this, there is a rising popularity of funeral policies because under funeral policies, you can cover more people. They do have a lower barrier to entry, so they are easier to get than life insurance. And the payout is usually quicker than with life insurance because it's meant to pay for the funeral. Another thing to consider is that funeral policies have a far lower monthly premium than life insurance, which is important when taking into account the socioeconomic conditions of most South Africans. Because funerals can have such a heavy financial burden, and also because they have such an important role to play in the mourning process, what Rosemary did in Witness's case, and would continue to do, only increases the impact she had on victims. She didn't only snatch away their loved ones. She also ensured that the funeral process was not properly funded, even though there was such a huge amount of money available for it. She could have easily paid for Witness's funeral herself, and still had a huge chunk of money. But that wasn't her intention. She wanted it all for herself. I also wanted to mention, because it's important for everyone to know, Edward says that there is a serious trend right now of people taking out funeral policies on family members, and when that person passes away, we're not talking about murder here, the person is passing away of causes unrelated to the person with the policy, that beneficiary is taking a payout of, for instance, 30,000 rand, and only contributing perhaps 1,000 rand to the funeral, and pocketing the rest. Edward says that there are thousands of cases where instances like this are tearing families apart. Now, while it's bad enough to do something like that, actually killing the person to claim that policy is something entirely different. By 2013, it seems that Rosemary and Lovu had burned through the entire 131,000 rand she'd claimed from Witness's murder. Either that, or the taste of that money had just encouraged her to act again quite quickly. Really, it's important to think about these crimes as the acts of a serial killer. Because they were so well planned and seemed to have only had a financial motive, at least on the surface, it may be easy for us to forget that. Serial killers do tend to start off slowly and then quickly shorten the cooling off periods between their crimes. And as we'll discuss later, money wasn't the only thing Rosemary was gaining from these murders. There was also power and control, which is so common with most serial killers. And that becomes almost an even bigger draw card for killers than the money. Audrey Ndlovu was Rosemary's only full biological sibling. Her other siblings had been born after her mother and the two youngest had fled from Maria Mbuweni, the Sangoma, and Rosemary's mother had then met a man who she'd married and had five more children with. Audrey and Rosemary had taken the new stepfather's surname. 
Ndlovu. Audrey lived in Tembisa in a small room in the backyard of a homeowner. She struggled significantly financially, and although she'd been employed by a company in Johannesburg for many years, that job had ended and Audrey had struggled to find work again. She started selling Tupperware, and the single room she lived in was stacked with the brightly coloured containers. Audrey had had one son from a marriage which had dissolved. Her son, Brilliant, had lived with her until she had lost her job, and then she struggled to support them both, so he'd gone to live with his father's family. Audrey was incredibly proud of her police officer's sister, and she also occasionally relied on her for financial help during the month. It was the level of poverty that Audrey lived in that would later make police very suspicious. When they discovered that there were life insurance and funeral policies in Audrey's name, to the value of 700,000 rand. Audrey most certainly did not have enough money to pay for these policies. But they were being paid every month, and police would eventually find a voice recording of a woman signing up telephonically for these policies and claiming to be Audrey Nlovu. But it was not Audrey. A voice expert would later confirm that the woman on the phone was Rosemary Ndlovu. Now, fraudulently posing as her sister was a crime in itself, and also Audrey had no idea these policies were being taken out on her. But if it weren't for those two things, Rosemary could probably just say she was making sure there would be enough money available to bury her sister and that her nephew would be taken care of in case she passed away. But there's the small issue of that amount. When deciding on an amount for a life insurance or funeral policy, you have to take into account what is called an insurable interest. I can't just pick a random person and take a life insurance or funeral policy out on them. I have to have what is called an insurable interest invested in that person. So that person's death has to financially impact me in some tangible way in terms of either loss of income or some other financial asset, or a potential expense, such as a funeral, which I would be directly responsible for should that person pass away. And that's really key in these cases. And also... A bit of a blurry line. Rosemary did have an insurable interest in her victims in terms of her being either a family member or a partner of those people. But if we look a little deeper, she wouldn't have experienced a financial loss as a result of their deaths. Only, really, if she had to pay for their funerals. Her sister Audrey was most certainly not contributing any money monthly toward Rosemary or even their mother. In fact, she was often borrowing money from Rosemary. So Rosemary would not have suffered financially as a result of Audrey's death. Certainly, having a small funeral policy for her destitute sister would have been wise, since no one else in her family was really in a position to do so but there was no valid explanation for an insurable interest to the value of 700,000 rand. I said earlier that Sangomas and traditional healers play a pretty large role in this case in various ways, and Audrey's death is one of those ways. Audrey was good friends with a woman called Mrs. Ngope, who was her neighbour and also a traditional healer. Audrey had developed a strong friendship with the woman and often shared her troubles with her. On the 25th of June 2013, Audrey had been getting ready to go to church when her cell phone rang. It was her sister Rosemary. She said she had just arrived at the taxi rank up the road and she wanted Audrey to walk up and fetch her. Audrey was surprised because her sister very rarely visited her and also because Rosemary had her own vehicle, so it was strange that she'd be using public transport. 
Either way, Audrey was excited for the surprise visit from her sister. She met Rosemary at the taxi rank, and they walked back to her room. Just before they entered, Mrs. Ngope passed by. Audrey stopped the woman and very proudly introduced her sister, the police officer, to her neighbour. If it hadn't been for this chance meeting, it's very possible that no one would have known that Rosemary had been at Audrey's home that day, and she never would have been linked to what happened next. When Rosemary and Audrey arrived at Audrey's room, they decided to make tea and some bread to eat. Rosemary commented that the bread Audrey had would not be enough for both of them, and her sister should go to the shop and get more. In the meantime, Rosemary said she would make the tea. Audrey got more bread, and the sisters ate and drank tea together. It's believed that while Audrey was at the shop, Rosemary had added poison to her sister's tea. She left straight afterwards, but Mrs. Ngope would later testify that she had seen Rosemary return to Audrey's room later that afternoon. The reason for this return visit would only be understood later on. The return visit had stood out to Mrs. Ngope because she'd been under the impression that Audrey was headed out to church as Rosemary left, and that usually lasted some hours, so she didn't think Audrey would have already returned by the time her sister headed back to her room. Unfortunately, Mrs. Ngope had no idea that Audrey had never left her room, because she couldn't. The next morning, Mrs. Ngope was surprised to see Rosemary and Glovu once again. For a woman who barely ever visited her sister, this was now the third time in two days, and Rosemary seemed upset. She asked Mrs. Ngope when she'd last spoken with Audrey. She said her sister wasn't answering her phone, and Rosemary was worried about her. Her eyes filled with tears, Mrs. Ngope said, which she found odd, because there was really nothing she could see at that point to be upset about. Rosemary began to insist that Mrs. Ngope accompany her to Audrey's room. The woman initially refused, saying she couldn't understand why that was necessary, but Rosemary continued to insist, eventually bursting into tears and saying she couldn't face going there alone. Mrs. Ngope was completely bewildered by the woman's behaviour and finally just agreed to accompany her. A few times along the way, Rosemary collapsed to her knees in floods of tears and the astonished Mrs. Ngope had to pick her up and usher her along. Before they even entered Audrey's home, Rosemary called her mother on her cell phone and began to loudly declare that Audrey was dead. Mrs. Ngope gasped and shouted at Rosemary not to say such things. Just because Audrey wasn't answering her phone didn't mean she was dead. But Rosemary continued hollering out and eventually drew a crowd of onlookers. The neighbours would eventually take over attempts to gain access to Audrey's room. Everything was locked up, and burglar bars on the windows and doors meant no one could get in, so a grinder was located and they began to grind away at the bars, while Rosemary sat back, wailing and fanning herself. She also called one of her colleagues from Tembisa police station, who rushed out to the scene with another police officer. They were able to gain access to the room and found Audrey Ndlovu dead on her bed. Mrs. Ngope noticed that two teacups still stood inside the room while all the rest of Audrey's dirty dishes were in a wash basin outside, and this seemed strange to her. She pointed them out to the police officers and said they should take them as evidence. Upon hearing this, Rosemary picked up the two cups and rinsed them out. Her colleague tried to stop her, reminding her that it was evidence. But Rosemary seemed lost in her grief, the officer said, so she didn't press the issue. 
Despite Rosemary's seeming urgency to gain access to her sister's room to figure out whether she was dead or alive, in the days, months, and even years afterwards, she did not press for Audrey's death to be investigated. And it wasn't, really. When the docket was next looked at again many years later, only a few witness statements and the autopsy report was inside. Very little had been done to discover who had murdered Audrey and Lovu. The pathologist's report said that blood could not be drawn from Audrey's body to test for poison because she was too decomposed. Audrey's body had been in a warm room covered with a blanket for 24 hours before being discovered. Now, I will say that the experts I asked have never seen a body that after 24 hours would be in such a condition that no blood would be available for a toxicology test. And you can do toxicology from tissue, like kidneys and liver, and not just blood. So, as we'll discuss later, it seems that Audrey certainly did not receive the type of investigation she deserved, and we'll never know how much of that was because Rosemary was a police officer at the same station that was handling her murder. Besides this, the photographs of Audrey's body show something else. Audrey was clearly strangled. And I haven't seen this autopsy report, and I don't know whether that determination was actually made by the pathologist, but the prosecutors would eventually use that as their cause of death. So it seems likely that it was picked up in the autopsy report. But the investigation went no further than it had that day at Audrey's room, until much, much later on. Essentially, it is believed and would later be accepted by the judge that on the initial tea visit, Rosemary had poisoned Audrey. She had then left Audrey's room and returned later, which she denied, but Mrs. Ngope testified to. And it was at this time that she'd realized Audrey was perhaps incapacitated, but not dead, and she'd proceeded to strangle her sister. In Naledi Shange's book, Killer Cop, which I must say is very victim-focused, something that I really admire from a true crime author, she says that of all the horrendous murders Rosemary committed, this one haunts her the most. She says she can't stop thinking about what Audrey must have thought in her final moments, as she realized that she was being betrayed by her sister, who she loved and admired so much. Ten days after Audrey and Lovu's death, Several different policies paid out to Rosemary. Her sister's murder netted her more than 700,000 rand in total. Rosemary did contribute to Audrey's funeral, but no more than the amount that was being contributed by all her other siblings. She could have single-handedly paid for a very nice send-off, but of course, that would seem suspicious. A few months later, she made improvements on her mother's house in Bushbuck Ridge, and she visited her with a carload of groceries. Sophie and Lovu was the only family member who ever received any assistance from Rosemary after her several windfalls. A deep bond seemed to exist between the woman and her mother, and one can only wonder what Sophie would have thought if she knew her home improvements and groceries were paid for with literal blood money from her own daughter's murder. Although Audrey's son, Brilliant, was now left without a mother, Rosemary did not give the young man a single cent to help him get by. In fact, he could have no idea that his aunt would, in just a few years, have her eye on him as a possible victim, too. First, though, Rosemary had other things to do. There was someone closer to home who she'd set her sights on next. In 
And by 2015, she decided that five years with Maurice Mashaba as her partner was more than enough for her. And Rosemary Ndlovu was ready to be a widow again. And that is where I'm going to leave it for part two. Yes, there's going to be a part three. I did warn you that might happen. I'll definitely try and get part three out to you in just a few days, though. So keep your eye on the feed. For now, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.